panel of the day is entitled The Law Firm as a Business. And this panel will discuss how law firms function as businesses and some of the attributes that define a successful commercial lawyer and what the future may look like for the trainees within those firms. And during the discussion, we will be taking questions from the audience. So please hold your questions until then. Um, I'm now going to hand you over to Matthew Broadbent. Broadbent, sorry, your floor career is going to be hosting. Sorry, Matt. Remember, remember me, yes. Um, thanks, Beth. And, and thanks again to Yindi for a really... Um, inspiring talk there. I think that sounds like a you know, fantastic career. Who could, who could not want to have a, have a, have a life like that? So um, the purpose of this panel is to, as, as Beth says, to just look at some of the real nuts and bolts of these organisations that you're going to be joining um, and think about how they actually run. Because one of the things you're going to have to be able to do is convince people that might recruit you that you actually understand the business that you're proposing that you join. So if you've got some of that background understanding, that's, that will hopefully go a long way. We're also going to do a bit of crystal ball gazing into what it means to be a, a, someone starting their legal career now and um, how that might differ from our uh, panel of senior people um, and you know, what, what, what exciting things are coming. So um, first of all, I'd like to um, ask the panel to introduce themselves uh, and talk to us a little bit about their firm and themselves and then we'll, um, then we'll fire into the, to, to the meat of the, uh, of the talk. So, pardon me. First thing to say is I'm, I'm not em Emily. <laughs> um, we, 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 we sat out of our position. So good morning, everyone. Um, Parham Kuchikeli. Uh, I am a partner at RPC. I focus on commercial and financial uh, disputes. Um, I'm also the training principal uh, at RPC. I also sit on the steering committee for IND and head, the, head up the ethnicity work stream there couple of just things about me. I trained at a magic circle firm. I was there for 12 years before moving as partner to RPC six years ago. So um, I've got a sense of different firms and hopefully when we talk about that, I, uh, I can share some of that thought. And just personally, um, I'm originally from Iran. I came to this country when I was eight years old. Um, I didn't speak English at that time, but um, I, uh, my family put a lot of emphasis on working hard and education. So uh, that's why I studied law. And uh, as Yindi said, uh, first year law is often very challenging, but ultimately it's rewarding. So look forward to sharing some thoughts with you. Great, Emily. Hi, um, I'm Emily from Skeltvig. I'm a partner at Osborne Clark. I'm a, um, a partner in the property disputes team. So um, a lot of what I do is large scale infrastructure disputes, um, particularly for energy companies, utilities and telecoms. Um, so it's particularly busy at the moment with the likes of HS2 and the new electronic communications code that came out. So OC are an international law firm. We've got around um, 925 uh, fee earners and we've got uh, offices over 25 different locations in the US, Asia and Europe. Um, I think, you know, a, a lot of what I've heard today um, is, you know, completely accurate. I would say, you know, at university, it seems really, really difficult. But this um, has been the most rewarding career for me. So I would say, you know, I'd echo everyone's um, thoughts and, and, and say persevere, because it's definitely, definitely worth it at the end of the day. Thank you. Laura. Hi, everyone. I'm Laura Lintos. I'm a senior associate at Charles and Hamlin's. I'm in contentious construction. I do both international work and domestic from international arbitration. There's lots of it in the Middle East advised at the moment to uh, domestic adjudication. Um, I was told once when I was about to qualify that uh, because I was in disputes, general commercial, and I was told, oh, you want to qualify it into um, contentious construction? That's not sexy enough. <laughs> and I said, what's sexier than a Burj Khalifa or a Channel Tunnel or the Grosvenor Hotel around the corner? So uh, I disobeyed and I'm very happy I did. <laughs> um, by way of background, so uh, I always say I'm German, Austrian, Greek, Romanian, born in the Czech Republic. <laughs> and, <laughs> and the reason for that is if I say only one out of those, eventually you'll discover that it's all a lie because there are other elements. So I say it all in one package. <laughs> Um, born in deep communism, uh, obviously I planned very well in advance that I want to be a contentious construction English lawyer, as you can see, so I embraced opportunities as they came. Uh, it's a very rewarding career and I'm very happy later on to speak to you about why you should do construction law. <laughs> Great, well thanks everybody. I mean, I, I'm, I'm noting that we have a, uh, a strong contentious um, bent today, so um, that, I, I'm, I always find that the people on the contentious side are good talkers, so I think we're in for a treat. 
Um, so let's let's delve into let's delve into this 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 concept of a of a, of a law firm, a commercial law firm. Um, they're a business. So I guess the bottom line is, um, Emily, how do they make money? Well, you know, I, I think law firms are no different than any other business out there. So um, we have to ensure that our margins are correct. We have to ensure that we are charging clients um, the correct fees. And I, and I think, you know, as a junior, what can often be lost is um, how hard you're working, but then not necessarily turning that into um, fees and, and profit. And so it's really important, you know, and particularly at OC, we do this from the, the, the ground roots level uh, to teach people early on the importance of not just doing your chargeable hours, but actually converting that into a profit. Because if you're, you know, you're not being paid for what you're doing, then, you know, the law firms are going to go out of business very quickly. So uh, for me, the key message is we're exactly like any other business. We're a service industry. We've got to keep our clients happy, um, but at the end of the day, we've got to make sure our clients pay for our services. Okay, well, I mean, that, that, that brings up a real key question, actually. How do you decide what to charge your clients? Oh, that, that gets done by someone far, far more intelligent than me on the financial uh, side of things. But um, in all seriousness, it is something that's taken... Um, into sort of deep consideration every year. So um, every year, a lot of law firms do change their rates and it's something that they consider, you know, you know really, uh, really carefully. And it's made up of a number of factors, including, you know, what our base costs are. So the cost of our offices, the cost of the support staff, because I've obviously told you how many staff that we've got as fee earners, but us fee earners couldn't do our job without our PAs, without our finance team, without our BD team, without our, um, well, I'll come on to talk about it later, without our um, coding team. So all of those costs have to be taken into account when you're considering how you set your hourly rate. And then um, in addition to that, you've got to consider your position in the market and um, you know, where you want to place yourself and how you value your services um, for your clients compared to um, the other law firms. Great, thank you. And we'll, 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 we'll push into some of those points in a minute. Um, I guess the, the one thing that you've sort of b brought out there, and um, Laura, if you could expand on this. I mean, law firms are a bit like a shark. They have to keep on moving or they'll die. So what are the things that causes a law firm to, 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 to change its emphasis, to do new things, to, to, to keep reinventing itself? Well, first of all, I think we all are sharks here. I hope. Um, but yes, um, so evolution to me is flexibility as well as being strong and persevere um, in everything that you're doing, being motivated. I think for law firms, we all are part of the pandemic now. Most of the law firms have adapted. The good thing about trials, I can say from personal experience, you as trainees, you would be working from uh, home um, as well as from the office. You would be expected at the office to be for two or three days and hopefully cover the same days as your supervisors. So that's one thing. Uh, another element, important element is innovation and technology. Massive driver these days, don't be afraid of it. Embrace it. Um, it's something that can actually contribute to acceleration and quality of our service if utilized well. And I can only say that um, it's an advantage we should push even more forward um, to, to evolve. Another thing I'm gonna say is female partnership. So I'm not a partner yet myself, I say yet. <laughs> um, um, hopeful thinking, wishful thinking. But anyway, 42% of partners at Trials and Hamlins are female. And, and that already gives you a flavor where this is all heading, i.e. equality, which is massively important. Um, so I think that's from me. Yeah. Okay, great, yes. Well, yeah, I, mean, I, th I think, that, yeah, as I say, the, the, Innovation is, is one of the key words. You can't you can't sit still. Um, now now of course um, I think uh, Emily, you mentioned your place in the market. So I think one of the other things that you guys have all got to do is you've got to try and work out how all these weird named organisations all fit together. How do they you know who's who's who and who's what? So um, Param, can you can you just give us a feel for what what you might say that the, the core categories of law firms are? I mean, you mentioned Magic Circle already, so it's probably a starting point. Sure. I mean, I think. I think one of the things to say before I do that is what is the use of categorizing because we can categorize individuals into so many categories and you can do that with law firms as well. So it's useful to, to, to us because we compete with each other to know who our, our competition is. So if I'm running the 100 meters, I'm not competing with someone doing the pole vault. I mean, that would be a waste of my, my time. 
and it's useful to our clients because they want to know for a particular type of work who to go to and what the mar market is. But I'm going to talk about why it's useful to you and echo something which Yindi said at, at the beginning, that there is a law firm out there for, for all of you and you need to find your match. Uh, so therefore, you need to have an understanding of the types of law firms out there. So this is not an academic exercise in terms of categorization, but the things I would be thinking about if I was in, in your shoes is, um, do you want a firm that has international offices? Do you want a firm that's regional more or London-based? Um, do you want a firm that is very large in terms of size, in terms of revenue, so on? Or do you want somewhere a bit smaller because different cultures appear in, because of size? It's just the reality of the world. The bigger the size, the culture is more difficult to maintain. Others may disagree with me. So size is, is one thing. Then practice areas. So if you now know that you know you, you want to be a disputes lawyer, you, you will be looking at which firms are sort of very strong in disputes, for example. If you want to be a corporate lawyer, you probably look at those. Although, again, echo our keynote speaker, treat it with a pinch of uh, salt, because I wanted, like her, to become a corporate lawyer when I started my training contract, and then I, I, I saw the light and became a a litigator. So you, 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 you need to know uh, sort of what practice area you, you're in. Um, I think those are, and then there are boutique firms as well. So very small firms which do not offer the full service range of practice. That's one other way I would categorize firms, you know, full service or very niche in terms of a particular practice area. Um, those are things to consider and see what your personality is and find your match. And I think the most important thing for you guys is to do your research on those areas and then find the right match. And also, maybe there is a, although slightly controversial, there is a, a, a distinction between US firms and s s some other firms in terms of a sort of the cultural side of things because of size and the, 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 the American Great, thank you. Yeah, so I think that yeah, one of the skills to develop is sort of looking at a firm and immediately having a sort of set of questions that you can use to come up with those ideas. Because you're going to spend a lot of time discarding firms because you can only really research a, a finite number in, in, in extreme depth. Um, now, we, we, we've already mentioned about you know, how firms keep on moving, keep on changing. I mean, like, like, like any business, growth is seen as one of the great things that's important. Um, and there's, you know, there's, there are a couple of classic ways in which we, we see firms. Um, growing mergers versus organic growth. So can you just tell us what, what, what that actually means, Emily, and, 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 and perhaps why one or other um, has pluses and minuses? Sure. I mean, I have... So before I joined C, I actually came from um, Charles Russell before they came, uh, Charles Russell Speechleys. So I, I um, managed to escape before um, a merger to OC. I shouldn't say escape, but I, I, um, I left before um, a merger. I think um, both options um, has its um, benefits. So with a merger, you will get an immediate growth. And so there will be an immediate increase of profit, um, a gradual reduction in cost, because obviously you are gradually bringing two firms together. So you are reducing the number of buildings, reducing the number of support staff, etc. cetera. Um, but the difficulties with a merger, and we have seen it you know, with the, the bigger mergers that have taken place, is you are bringing two different firms together and uh, they will be very different culturally. So it can be a very tricky challenge to ensure that they are all working in the same direction. They um, are all aligned culturally um, and they are all together in terms of moving the, the firm forward. So um, it's not something that Osborne Clark have um, actually looked at. Instead, we've looked at organic growth and we have grown something like 15% year on year. And we've done that in a number of ways, um, but one of the best ways that we have done it is bringing talent through. So we've got a really good trainee uh, program and we've got a great solicitor apprentice uh, program. And so year on year, we are retaining most of the trainees and the apprentices that come through. So that's uh, boosting our numbers. And we've also um, got a very keen program for lateral hires. So we are bringing people 
in the business at all different levels and we are constantly looking out in the market to see who we can bring over and we've um, we've done that as individuals and we've also done that as uh, teams that we've brought over and we've integrated and the benefit for us in that is we've been able to find the individuals or find the team make sure they culturally fit with OC and um, grow OC um, that way rather than having a you know all-encompassing merger where we could risk our culture which is so so precious to us at OC being watered down or ruined um, by by merging great thank you well I'm, we're going to come back to a bit more about culture in a minute um, I mean, I guess, I guess just one thing, just just to add on to that and ask you is like, well, what, what's the kind of question then you should ask someone that, that you meet today from a firm to, to to establish how their growth is happening? I mean, what, yeah, just how how do you grow? I guess is the. But I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I think that's a really good question to ask as a starting point, and I I would also ask and 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 do ask me, um, what what do you think is going to happen over the next five or ten years, um. Because I think that's really important for law firms. So we're at a point where we want to continue growing, but a lot of law firms have got to the point where they are quite happy with their size. So they will um, grow year on year by bringing people in, but they won't necessarily want to grow extensively because we'll come on to it later, but it, it can again um, be difficult culturally when you become a larger firm. So I would ask the question, um, you know, what is your law firm going to do in the next five to 10 years? Sure. Sure. Now, now, of course, we, we, we've certainly mentioned competition already. Laura, I mean, uh, um, how do firms get business? How do they, they keep their existing clients? How do they find new ones? You mean how, the, how they manage to stay afloat and bring in the money? Um, yes, <laughs> business development, one of the key skills that every lawyer should have. And uh, by all means, you know, having legal skills is the essential, but it's also something that's automatically um, expected. And so with business development, I, I sometimes compare it to, to the dating game because it's all very nice to, first of all, get on the date, <coughs> i.e., excuse me, <coughs> i.e., attend an interview or something like that. <coughs> but it's another thing to actually shine during the, the interview or the date. Excellent, you impressed your counterpart. But actually, most firms fail or survive because of what happens after the first date, which is the aftercare, which, are, which, are, which I call personal attraction relationship that keeps you going. And I know we are all businesses, but it is the personal relationships that carry us. And it's, so it's very important from this age, you are, from this stage you are at, actually, to start making friends because you never know where those friends will end up being. But that's a very cynical view. Of course, making friends in general is very, very good. Um, but just build your connections. And you never know what will happen, who will be where. Um, many, and, and we will speak about this later, many lawyers uh, will go in-house. Some of them will um, become partners, etc., etc. So your uh, current co-student could be your future client. And in terms of uh, um, other, other ways of uh, generating business, I would say don't be scared to be different. Sometimes uh, the market can be a bit oversaturated with the same approach. Um, and know your audience. Um, one, tar one set of tar target audience can uh, respond very well to something that another segment would not. Uh, does that answer the question? Yeah, well, great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Param, I think you have some, some uh, comments about um, some of the techniques that, that people at RVC have used. Well, I think uh, I, I echo everything that's been said, but I think um, we, we, we are a strange bunch, partners of law firms or senior leaders, because we, we kind of have to uh, win the work, do the sales stuff. We have to then do the work and manage the work. Then we have to do the relationship side. Then we have to also do the financial side, make sure the money comes in, things that Emily was talking about. So it's it's multifaceted mm. skill set, which is quite strange. I mean, if you were in an investment bank, as I was for many year, years in Comber, they, they would say, you're mad to be doing this. You know, someone should sell, someone should do the work, someone should do... But anyway, that, that's, the, that's the way law firms uh, operate. But the entrepreneurial and commercial side of law is hugely important. And we at RPC are very entrepreneurial. So we ask our associates very early on, even sort of trainees, to get involved in BD, their networks, to go out there, because winning the work, getting the referral, having that profile is as important 
as doing the work. I mean, if you're solely interested in doing the work, there's an argument, well, you, you might sort of even become a barrister. Although even barristers, I mean, I was in Dubai last week for a conference, and the barristers were out there selling, you know, big time. So the, the, the whole sort of entrepreneurial side and the law as the business is something that you, you as a generation have got to learn earlier than I think I did and probably you guys did, I don't know, but um, it, it, it's, it's really important to develop that skill set as well as the people. So, so if you can develop those sales, sales and relationship skills early in the piece, yeah. then you're, you, you make yourself attractive. And I think, exactly, and I think it's been said already, your networks are going to be the platform to do that as, as, as you all rise together and get to know each other through different sort of forums and, and things. So maintain relation. Even today is a great opportunity to network with each other and, and sort of because you will all rise together. Absolutely. So, so sticking with you, Param, um, and now, now getting back to what we were talking about, mentioning cu culture, I guess one of the things you're doing when you're going out and winning business is, is articulating the, the culture of the firm. So maybe you could let us know how, how does a firm develop its culture and how does it, how does it describe it? Yeah, I mean, I think culture is a, is a very interesting thing because you ask any law firm, uh, you know, they say, we've got a good culture. You know, there's, there's no one at a law firm that's going to say, yeah, we've got a horrendous culture. <laughs> uh, with, with a few firms, maybe the exception because that's their USP. But, um, <laughs> but, but, but everyone says we've got a good culture. But culture is based on the people who are in the building. <coughs> so I think from an RPC point of view, we see that as our USP and we are very sort of, we jealously guard the types of people we have in our building. I think it's similar uh, uh, for, for, for the firms to, to my left because I know them. And I think that's important to kind of have a rigorous process. So to give you an example, if we had a lateral partner who was gonna come to RPC that was gonna bring, I don't know, six million pound book of business on year one, but they were a total so-and-so, there's no way we would bring them in because uh, you, you have to guard that je jealously. And the culture is set by the people at the top and their behaviors. So for example, how we handled the pandemic, what was the managing partner saying on terms of health and well-being? you know, switch off, do. So th these small things make a huge difference. And I think, our USP, and I don't hide it, when I go out and talk to sort of potential uh, students, is that we have a different culture to, say, a magic circle firm or a the US firm or, or what have you. Part of that is size, but part of that is the people that we bring. And then on the client side, people like doing business with people. So... On the client side, again, the way we market ourselves, I'm sure other law firms do, is that we're good at what we do, but we're also nice people. So if you're gonna be stuck in a room on a dispute with someone, you probably will take into account the, the second as well as the first, because there's so many lawyers who could probably do the same job as, as I do, but hopefully they, they'll, they'll enjoy spending some time with me in the room as well. Great. And, and do you, do, Evan, do you, do, does your firm have a, a sort of any sort of pithy type, you know, single sentence way that you try and get the culture across quickly? I mean, a lot of firms have these sort of value statements now. Is this something like that? Um, I think that can be slightly overrated. I think, um, you know, I think you can talk the talk, but it's about walking the walk. And that's what we are at OC. We're not hierarchical. Um, I, I, hopefully you can tell from me I'm the type of partner that we have um, we're, we're very open um, we encourage ideas from all levels um, and um, we really like people that are slightly outside of the box and I absolutely agree with you that's what our clients want and we listen to that you don't want to be sat in a room with people that I call suits um, you want to be sat in a room with someone that's a real person and so I would definitely have a think about that when you're choosing your law firm. Sure. And I'm Laura, are the, thing, are the things maybe that if, you, if you're meeting a firm today as, as one of our delegates, question, quick, what are the kind of probing questions you'd ask to try and establish what the culture is like? Gosh, probing questions. I think sometimes the presence and the energy in the room can tell you much more than actual words said. So um, 
just to just to diverge from that, if I may, a little bit. So in terms of culture, I think it's very difficult to say a firm has a culture. There are tendencies and it trickles from the top. I agree there are things that can be improved. But essentially, even if I, I trained initially at White and Case and I stayed there for four years. And then uh, and now I'm at Trouse, which is very, very different. But I think it's essentially about the people, the team that you immediately work with. And so they make your everyday life bearable or unbearable or wonderful. And so um, it's, it's impossible for a firm to guarantee that out of their hundreds of employees, every single one is going to be amazing to work with. So, so that's number one. Number two is when you walk into that room, I would say, see if you click with those people, because I know we, well, I'm going to talk about myself rather than imply what you think. When I entered into those rooms, interviewing for training contract, all I wanted to do is to be picked, is to be chosen. And I didn't listen to sometimes the intuition, which was telling me I'm, I really clicked well with these people, but I really didn't click well with those. So I would say, be perseverant and don't, don't take always no for an answer, absolutely, but also don't spend your life trying to persuade somebody to love you or like you uh, who clearly has something else on their mind. Just be with those who already embrace you. There's a twinkle in their eye that gives you that incentive. Um, in terms of questions, pr probe them. By all means, be prepared, have your questions, not only generic, generic questions about the size of the firm. Basically, frankly, you can read that all up, but you can ask them about the daily day-to-day uh, -day life, the involvement of trainees, the involvement at different levels, and you will be able to tell, is it really hierarchical? Do people talk to each other? Are they patient with each other? Are they kind to each other? Do they support each other at all levels? So a trainee can save a partner and a partner can support a, an associate to, to make it a partner. It's so it works both ways. Great, thank you. Um, right, we, we've got to keep moving. Um, I think we'll, 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 what's going to come through, I think, in the second part is what, <coughs> what makes a good commercial law. So we'll, we'll, we'll leave that until then. But just, just one thing that just sort of in, been in the news recently. We've got the, you know, we've had COP26. We're very much in a, in a, in, a, in an era where people are looking at what's the, the role of big organisations within society at large. So what, what, are, what, what are law firms doing? What are their responsibilities to the society around them? Emily, I think you had some discussions, particularly on environment. Yes. So, I mean, um, I think um, what very much became clear out of uh, COP26, and we actually sent quite a large delegate of um, partners, um, uh, associate directors and senior associates to the event but what very much um, resonated at that event was that we can't just sit back and wait for the government to do something about it as a large organization um, I sort of said it a minute ago we've got to stop talking the talk and we've got to start walking the walk so at OC um, we have um, got a dedicated team actually called OC Planet that's looking at what we can be doing and what we should be doing and they're implementing um, policies um, sort of immediately to try and do that and one of the most exciting projects that we've got on at the moment is our project halo which is the brand new building um, that um, we're having built in bristol and that when it's built uh, it's going to be completed in the summer next year that is going to be the most environmentally friendly building um, in bristol and actually across most of the uk and it's really exciting to be working with the construction company to achieve that and we've got all of our employees feeding into it. So I was in the Bristol office yesterday and we have got, you know, various things scattered around the building for our employees to look at and um, feedback on and say, you know, really test us as a partnership to say, are we doing enough? Can we do more? And so um, I would say that's the most exciting thing we've done. Um, but we are doing various other um, uh, other sort of um, schemes um, from the from the minute, which is, you know, just having a really good recycling policy to the major, like changing up the buildings that we want to have as a company. So, so actually, these, these sort of initiatives are another good way of understanding the culture and the values of an organisation. So mo moving on, um, uh, actually, why don't we see, <laughs> does anybody want to ask a question now? Let's give you guys a chance to speak, otherwise we're going to run out of time. Yep, over here. Hi, hi there, um, my name is Mohammed. Thank you uh, so much for giving your time and actually explaining us uh, how law firms are operating. And kudos to the Law Careers team for actually arranging this event. 
So uh, my question is that, you know, in this era of digitization, you're seeing that technology startups and the field of technology is rising. So my question is, do you think that are there any other practice areas which will be adversely affected by in this era of digitization? Since we're seeing Google, Facebook and tech startups going very forward and fast and the amount of money they're generating with the equity people are investing into it. So do you think, are there any other practice areas which might be adversely affected in the negative terminology? Thank you. Shall I start? So, um, <laughs> I, so I think uh, technologies are having a huge impact on the legal sector. Um, so in my world, which is litigation, uh, disclosure and predictive coding has, I mean, we had the first case on predictive code, coding. And um, it is something that is inevitably going to continue in that world, which will mean that actually disclosure is a lot simpler, it's done digitally. A lot of that sort of uh, manual review side of things, things which can be commoditized, anything that can be commoditized is likely to become uh, done by artificial intelligence in some shape or form. But I, I, I say this, I wouldn't, you guys worry about it too much because <laughs> our business, our business is ultimately a people to people business and it's a relationship business. And certainly in my field, yes, disclosure can get done, but ultimately it's about the individual presenting their case to another individual. And that's not going to go away anytime soon in, in, in the litigation market. So law firms will adapt. Hopefully some of the more boring stuff will get done by <laughs> AR and we can do the kind of more strategic thinking. So I see this as, you know, as Gary Kasparov says, you know, the, the bringing together of machine and human to get a better outcome rather than machines taking away the jobs of lawyers. But there are some sort of doomsayers out there. I don't agree with it. I, I, I would absolutely agree with you. And who wants to do disclosure for about six months anyway? I promise you, it's really dull. It's really boring. So you want to do the more exciting, the exciting stuff that you get to do. I think law firms, um, we're definitely embracing it. Um, we, um, we've got uh, AI models in place for, for stuff like disclosure. And we, I mentioned earlier, we've got an in-house coding team um, who are actually made up of... Um, lawyers and also lateral hires that we've brought into the company and um, they produce platforms for our clients that are bespoke and they are absolutely incredible platforms that really allow us to embed our relationships with our clients but they also allow our clients to use our services a lot more easily and um, we're looking at the moment at um, potentially having um, some time for our trainees to spend some time with that team because it has become part and parcel of what we offer across the board to all clients now so understanding how you build those platforms how um, you make them work for particular clients is really important so I would say absolutely don't be afraid of it it's really exciting you will not have to do the boring disclosure that we had to do when we were juniors you, you might have to do the boring <laughs> photocopying we haven't got a computer for that quite yet um but it it will allow you to have um more varied and more interesting careers because we have to develop we have to evolve we have to become more innovative and um it will be more exciting for you ultimately Great. So we, we need to keep moving here. Um, uh, Karen, so we we're just sort of talking about innovation and change. How, your, your training principle, how, how are the firms going to change the way they recruit and train and retain people? Are the thing, are, we're not are going to change trends? at all. Do exactly the same. No. Um, <laughs> so I think the first, the, the, the first thing I, I say is that, uh, I mean, I meet a lot of prospective trainees who come on our back schemes, etc. I think what people want out of their careers are slightly different to what you know, how I was approaching. I just wanted want to get a training contract. And I didn't care about any of the sort of ESG, IND, work-life balance. I just wanted to do the work and, and that was it at that time. Your generation are, are much more advanced because you're thinking about it, the sort of round individual. And so we as law firms have to be attractive on, on that level to sort of have people who want, going back to the culture, to work in our building because if, if we're not, you guys will come in after three, four years, you'll leave. So another thing we are really focusing on is the sort of mentoring and the mid group and sort of on being on the IND steering committee, ensuring that that experience is great. And then the final thing, which we've been focusing on quite a lot, 
is the senior roles available in our organization. So the types of partnerships we now have, we have equity salaried fixed share partner, we have off council role. Um, so it, it means that people can choose to go down different roads, either as a stepping stone to something else or just to have a different career path. And that actually, I think, is going to attract more and develop over the year, years to, to come because this model of sort of equity partner and out which was the model when I started my training contract, equity partner or out, I should say, um, is, is, is kind of slightly old fashioned now. And people want different roles and law firms really value those roles and senior individuals. And not everyone necessarily needs to be a partner mm -hmm. because believe it or not, you know, um, as Yindi said, it's not like suits being a partner. <laughs> a, a lot of it is pretty, pretty pressurized and sort of, I won't go into it. So you, people choose different career paths. Sure. And I'll say, Laurie, you, you, you'd given some thoughts to that as well. So maybe your fund has been slightly yes. stolen. Well. Yes, I was thinking about it all night, actually. Um, there, are, there, are many, there, are many, <laughs> there are many ways uh, how to be a lawyer. You can, uh, you can be an in-house counsel or um, be in, in a company where you're close to the business and you're actually part of it, which is very, very exciting. You have your, your thoughts and fingers on the pulse of what's actually happening. And in a way, you are not removed from that. So your way of thinking might be very much more realistic than somebody who's, who's been their entire careers in private practice. Um, on the other hand, in private practice, as Param said, there are now these days different ways how you can progress and they are all very valid and very valuable to the firm and they have an effect on, on you, how you grow, uh, your uh, life work balance and all of that so you can uh, I don't want to repeat what you said, but in, in a nutshell, you know, counsel, different types of uh, partners, get more involved in innovation and, and other things. Um, and then I was just going to touch on something before what you said about innovation. What I do myself is, and this applies to the different roles in law as well, if I'm afraid of something, I try to get as much information as possible um, as I can. Because normally, once I've done that, I'm not afraid anymore. And for example, in construction law, we quite often utilize technology, technologies outside of you know, the disclosure exercise and even accounting and all of that, which means using drones on, on sites. And it made us, our clients, being able not to go insolvent, not having to hold, a, a hold off or postpone certain disputes because we could solve it with robotics and, and that sort of thing, which is immensely, immensely exciting. Um, and one more career trajectory, just jumping back and forth, is academia, of course. So um, I'm currently finishing a part-time PhD at Cambridge in, in party walls, uh, out of all uh, matters, which goes over to property law. Um, whereas at work at the office, I do international as well as domestic disputes. And you can do it. I, I have to admit, if it was pure maths or something, that I wouldn't be able to. But then it gives you the trajectory of being able to teach as well at university as well as to your work um, at, um, at the firm. So there are many options and combinations. Great, thank you. Well, we're nearly at time. I'm going to ask everyone to give us a very quick top tip. I think we might have time just for one really quick question. Fastest hand over here. I'm nearest the mic. Yeah. yeah, very close to the mic. Hi, my name is Grace Sutton, and I am an international student, currently doing the GDL. And I'm curious how your mentorship styles have changed as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and how you've supported your trainees as partners. Shall I take that one? Yeah, go for it. Um, so we've done quite a lot, actually, um, since the pandemic, which we've decided that we're going to uh, keep moving forward. So um, we have quite a few mentoring programmes. And one of the most interesting for me that I'm involved in is the reverse mentoring programme. So it's not all about people learning from partners. I think we can learn from the, the people that are coming up and we need to listen to them and we need to have direct access to people that are not necessarily in our team um, but are coming up. So we uh, have been doing a reverse mentoring programme that's very much been online, that's been very exciting um, and that has um, matched various people across our international offices with senior members um, and junior members. Um, in terms of the day-to-day, the -day, so I'm in charge jointly of a team, I laugh, of 46 people. So um, I, I, I treat them very much as each being um, like one of my um, children and I make it my mission to know what's going on in their life, um, you know, if they've got any issues, whether they're okay. Um, and we do that by touching base. So I touch base with 
each one of my staff at least twice a week. And we, um, we have calls specifically for that, but they can call me at any point. Um, and we make sure that we do it virtually. And now we're moving back into the office. We are making sure that we are in the office. Um, so the other partner as well. We're making sure we're in the office at least four times a week so that they can have those um, direct touch points with us. And um, we're also doing other stuff, you know, like we have hosted uh, magic events for the families so their kids get to, you know, watch uh, some magic events. We've been, um, you know, doing various social things that people get an opportunity to ask questions, to touch base, but also to have a bit of fun as well. So we've been doing a lot of that over the pandemic as well. Great, thank you. Um, we're just about out of time, but I think yeah, the, I'm sure that you guys will say it's about caring about your people. That's that's Absolutely. that's what matters. Okay, top tips, Parham. <coughs> top tips. Uh, <laughs> so I, I I think two things I'm going to mention. Uh, one is enthusiasm. I think um, one of the things you know, I mean, we take our sort of training contract process very seriously. We take our VAC scheme very seriously. And the, the, the biggest kind of pitfall that I see when I'm talking to people is, is someone who just doesn't want to be there and hasn't done the minimum effort to find out what you do, which I think is just inexcusable. I mean, why apply? I mean, if you're not enthusiastic about the firm you're applying to, it goes back to the types of firm, just don't apply. Apply to a firm that, you know, if, if it, so you have to have that enthusiasm and, and, and research the firms well. The other things, you know, you're not expected to know everything, but that level of enthusiasm and uh, uh, mm. sort of is important. And then the second thing is one that's going to stay with you throughout your career, and you're going to get picked up on it all the time, is commerciality. Uh, try to understand, and I think this session that has been put on for you guys is excellent because it's making you think about law firms as a business. Think about the commercial drivers for, for clients, for lawyers, you know, how law firms make money, why do clients come to us, and what lawyers ultimately are. I'm not a lawyer. I'm a problem solver. That's what I say I am. And I really don't care if I have to sort of not get involved in a bit of law, but find out through a relationship that I can solve a client's thing. So think about commerciality as well. Great. Thank you. Laura? Oh, right. Drive. Drive is very important. So what I was going to say is I feel from when I talk to people and also from my own experience, we have a tendency sometimes to stand in our own way, these little insecurities and all of that. There'll be plenty of obstacles on the way. Don't be insecure. Um, I always told myself, you know, I'm not better than anyone else, but also nobody else is better than me as a human being. And that sort of takes, a, they, takes away the fear and makes you wonder about things, makes you be more creative, ask the right questions. And if there is an obstacle, it means a change. Change can be and probably is painful. Just get around it, find a way through it, above it, doesn't matter. So I think the energy and drive and enthusiasm, very important. Great, yeah, so, so far you're all going out of the out of fear and showing huge enthusiasm. <laughs> and finally, Emily's gonna give the final piece of the jigsaw. Uh, I, I would echo um, uh, both of those, but I would say, say yes to everything particularly where it's really scary because actually the stuff that you push yourself to do will be the most valuable for Great. you. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you to all the panel. I think that was really, really useful. Um, I hope that, that, that you guys have, uh, is going to impact on your, your actions. Um,